Okay, page 30. Uh, last class, we, I started discussing the ionization, and uh, unfortunately, just got a little bit into it, probably made more confusion than I needed to, plus I think I misspoke on some part of it. So anyways, let's start again, go back to the beginning, and so don't write yet, just let me get, frame it again, and uh, then we'll get into the glory details, and it'll make total sense. I promise. The, uh, how'd it go? We got you. <laughs> okay, the, the reason we're doing this issue of kinetics and drug ionization is probably one of the uh, top few reasons how drug, why drugs behave the way they do in the body. And uh, since we have to spend a lot of time worrying about drugs getting absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and then eliminated, then all four of those categories, subcategories of kinetics, are influenced by <clears throat> a drug solubility in the body. And I said that uh, uh, because drugs are chemicals and when you take them in the body, they're essentially in solution and they behave just like a chemical would in solution in a beaker or whatever else. So we can come up with the same, similar properties, figure out what's going on. So first of all, number one, drugs are either acids or bases, and you have to know that ahead of time. An acid in chemistry is something that donates protons and a base accepts them, and it'll be one or the other depending on its chemical structure and what groups are there and what tendency they would have to give up uh, hydrogen ions, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have to know that you can have an acid with a pKa of 7 or you could have a base with a pKa of 7, right? The pKa doesn't tell you acid or base. You have to know that ahead of time, all right? So that's first of all, because I know as nurses, we're used to thinking, well, anything 7.4 or lower is acid. 7.4 or higher is basic. That's not the way it works with this. All right, so you got to get that out of your mind for drugs. So, uh, drugs are either acids or bases. So when they're put into the body, they're going to either uh, give up protons or accept them. And uh, what we refer to then is ionize, meaning gain a charge. So if a drug becomes ionized or gets charged, because it either gave up or accepted a proton, then it'll be more water soluble because things with the charge on them are able to dissolve in water because water has H pluses and OH negatives, which can interact or dissolve and interact with other chemicals easily. Because there's water in every cell and every inch, micro inch of your body, then it's uh, an acid or a base in, in water. So that's how it'll behave. And we can predict the behavior if the drug is going to be 100% ionized, charged, then it's going to be very much stay in the body water. It's not going to be able to pass through lipid barriers or go to lipid areas because it's got a charge. And I just showed you last class on that little drawing, the lipid bilayer. You can't get through the lipid bilayer if you have a charge because it'll be uh, repelled by the phosphates and et cetera, et cetera. If a drug does not have a charge, it is non-ionized, then it's lipid soluble. So ionized is water soluble, non-ionized is lipid soluble. Lipid soluble, of course, can go anywhere at once, anywhere inside the body, and into the body or anywhere around. Now, the three big categories we care about in anesthesia, there's others. Uh, the three big categories we care about is, number one, oral absor absorption, absorption from the GI tract. You want to get the drug into the body. Number two, because we give a lot of drugs IV, we don't have to worry about absorption, we just put them in the blood. Then we worry about distribution, and the two big areas that we worry about anesthesia-wise are, of course, into the brain, from the blood into the brain, because of the blood-brain barrier. And the placental transfer, passed to the placental barrier. If we're doing anesthesia in a pregnant mom, 
then you can worry about what drugs go to the baby and how much and when and et cetera, et cetera. So those are three big areas we worry about. And I mentioned last time, there's other ones in a breastfeeding mother, the, whether it's on a medication, is it going to go into the breast milk? And there's some other characterizations as well. Uh, transdermal, we don't really spend a lot of time with that. Uh, but they're not major issues in anesthesia, so we'll stick to the biggies, which is gastric, blood-brain barrier, and placental barrier is really uh, uh, what we look at. So that having been said, then how can we tell if a drug is taken into the body whether it's going to be ionized or not? Well, the way you can tell is because the drug company conveniently came up with what's called a PKA by experimental me methods. The PKA being the pH at which this drug will exist in the halfway point, 50% ionized and 50% non-ionized. So if you look on the top of page 30, there's the definition. PKA is an ionization constant, I mean it's always the same. And the pH at which the drug exists in solution has a 50% ionized and 50% non-ionized. Okay. So everybody with me so far on that? So, then I showed you, um, and let's jump up to page, where is it, uh, 32, that in different compartments in the body, there's different pHs. And, uh, for example, gastric pH, you see they're putting is from 1 to 3, uh, small intestine, uh, 5 to 6, uh, ilium 8, etc., etc., plasma 7.4, cerebral spinal fluid, a little bit of acidotic 7.3, urine can be anywhere from 4 to 8. So there's different pHs in the body, so the drug will have different behaviors in different parts of the body depending on this ionization or not, non ionization. Okay? So let's take an example. If I have an acid drug, now an acid drug means it's going to want to give up protons, right? And I swallow it. Right, we're going to do some problems here, but I'm just talking. If we do, I have an acid drug and I swallow it into the stomach, which is a very acid environment, pH 7.1 to 3, right? If I've got an acid in an acid solution, all right, our proton's going to be transferred or exchange? And the answer is no, you're right. And the reason is, the drug wants to give out protons, but the solutions are already tremendously acidic, it doesn't want to accept them, so it doesn't ionize. If it doesn't ionize, then it's non-ionized, in other words, and therefore it's going to be nicely absorbed through the stomach wall, because non-ionized means lipid soluble, and it'd be able to absorb very well. So one of the basic truisms, I can just say this right off the bat, it's pretty obvious, is acid drugs tend to be well absorbed in the stomach. If you know a drug is an acid and you take it orally, it's going to be pretty well absorbed because acids, when they're put in acid solutions, don't interact. That was my kind of lame thing where I was trying to say pitchers and catchers. In other words, if you have an acid in an acid environment, you got two pitchers, two, two substances want to give up the protons, none of them to accept them. All right. If you have a basic drug and you put it in a basic pH, it's going to be the same thing. A basic drug wants to accept protons, a basic pH solution wants to accept protons, there's nobody to throw them, you got two catchers, no pitcher. So therefore, it's not going to ionize. Or does everybody see that? So an acid in an acid environment will not ionize in a base in a basic. Basic drugs in a basic environment, pH, solution, will not ionize. Okay? So what will ionize? Well, obviously, if an acid is in a basic solution, or a base is in an acid solution. Then you got pitchers and catchers. One thrown, one's catching, you're all set. All right. So I've made up this little example, and um, 
And you can see from this that since we're talking about the PK is a logarithm, so uh, the log numbers, if from my little scale here, and I'll go to my cursor right here, this little scale, when the difference between the pH and the pKa, you take the two numbers and you subtract them from each other. So let's say you've got a, a drug that has a, an acid drug that has a pKa of 7.4. You put it in the bloodstream, pH is 7.4, subtract the two, there's no difference, they're the same, it equals zero. So then you're right here, 50-50, right? That's the definition of pKa. pH is which is 50-50. Well, what happens if the same compound, 7.4, is put into a solution of pH 7? So the difference between the two is 0.4. And if you look on my little scale here, when the difference is 0.5, either here or here, 0.5, it's about 75-25. Right, 0.4 would be here, but I don't want to split hairs. And right, let's just kind of round it off. So if I put take a drug out of the same drug, pKa is 7.4, and I put it in something that pH is 7. Let's say it's in urine, and urine happens to be pH 7 in this patient. So if you subtract the two, 7.4 and 7, the difference is 0.4. Don't worry about plus or minus, just get the number. And the difference is 0.4, and I'll round it off to 0.5, so I can show you that on my little scale. And so it's going to be 75, 25, something. Is it 75, 25? 75 non-ionized, 25 ionized, or is it 75 ionized, 25 non-ionized? It's one or the other, right? Now you got to figure out how, which way it goes by going to step two. So look on page 30. Step one was subtract the two, all right? And if the difference is less than one, figure out on the scale where you are. If the difference between the pH and the pK is greater than one, when I say greater than one, that means a ten times difference, right? Because it's ten to the one. These are logs. Then it's going to be essentially 100% something. It's going to be 100% ionized or 100% non-ionized. So if I take the pH and the pK and subtract them from each other, and the number I get is greater than one, then right off the bat, I know it's 100% something in the body. We say 99, but essentially 100%. All right, is it 100% ionized or is it 100% non-ionized? Well, you have to go to step two. See on page 30. So step two is, I guess I could go down here. Step two is, if it's an acid and an acid pH, it'll be primarily non-ionized two acids together, right? If it's a base and a base to pH, number two, it again will be non-ionized. Number three, if it's an acid and a basic pH, or number four, the base and an acid pH, it'll be ionized. So you got to know what is the drug, is it an acid or a base, and is the pH it's in more acidic or more basic than its pKa? Right. That's the whole thing. Now we're done. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Question. Yes. Um, I understand what the effect of it being ionized or ionized when the ratio is 99 to 1. Mm -hmm. But in the cases where it's 50% of both or the 75 to 25, does that mean that only part of the drug is going through and having yes. an effect? Yeah, good question. So let's say I have a drug that's 75 to 25. Let's say it's 75% ionized. 25% non-ionized, and I want it to go in the brain. Only the 25% is okay. going in the brain. So what the company has to do is give more milligrams. you okay. got to give a higher dose so that 25% of that higher dose will still be enough to reach the 99 Does that make sense? Okay. Now, how do you know whether it's an acid and an acid or an acid and a base and so on? 
Again, first of all, you got to know whether the drug is an acid or base. I'll always tell you that, or you can look it up, whatever. And then, here's the thing, and I think I screwed this up last time. You look at the pKa. So let's say I have a drug, and the pKa, it's an acid, and the pKa is 7. I will just make this up, all right? You can do this in, in your head. And I put it into a pH of 5. So, if the pK, pK is 7, what I'm really saying is when it's in a pH of 7, it's 50-50. Right? That's the definition of pKa. But I'm telling you it's in a pH of 5. So it's a much different pH. Let's subtract it. Acid drug pKa of 7, it's in a pH of 5. The pH is lower than the pKa, so therefore it's in a more acidic solution. All right. Let's say I take that same drug, and I, it's real easy. If it's lower, it's acidic. If it's higher, it's basic. That's what I'm getting at. So let's say I take the same drug, acid, and I put it into a pH of 7.1, and it's pKa is 7. All right. It's an acid. Now, in a more basic pH, because the pH is higher than the pKa. 7.1 is higher than 7. Does that make sense? Now, you can say to yourself, well, 7.1 is not basic. If I have a patient 7.1 and then I am in critical care, I, I'm thinking they're acidotic and I want to give bicarb or something, right? But that's not, this is different with the drugs. Right, question. Yeah, it's probably 55, 45, uh, 60, 40. You know, it's not, it's going to be a fraction. It's going to be a little bit off. So you just kind of round it? Yeah, you kind of round it off. All right, it's not exact anyways. So. Okay, well, that's it. Let's do some problems. Drug A, I'm going to, I'm the bottom of page 30. These little boxes, I just made these problems up. Okay? Drug A is an acid compound <coughs> excuse me, with a pKa of 7.1. It's put into an acid environment pH 6. So let's say it's somewhere in the early part of the intestine. Maybe it's a pH 6. All right. So let's figure it out. Is this going to be absorbed or not from the stomach? That's what I want to know. All right? You tell me. So here it is. It's a pKa 7.1. Step one in this little box on the bottom of page 30. Step one is subtract the two numbers. The difference between 7.1 and 6 is 1.1. Right? Well, now I know the difference between these two is 1.1. So when the difference is greater than 1, which it is, it's going to be 100% something. So it's either going to be 100% ionized or it's going to be 100% non-ionized. All right? Let's go to step two. Is it 100% ionized or 100% not? Well, it's an acid drug in a more acid environment. How do I know that? Well, I know you have to be told it's an acid drug, first of all. And because the pKa is 7.1, you put it into 6, it's more acid than 7.1. So it's an acid in an acid environment. Two pitchers, no catcher. It's not going to ionize, so it's going to be 100% non-ionized. Therefore, it's going to pass anywhere it wants to, because it's on a totally lipid soluble. All right? See that? All right, let's go to the next page and do some more. This is so much fun. <laughs> Page 31, the top box. Drug B is an acid drug with a pKa of 5. Get it on the camera here. Acid drug with a pKa of 5. 
you give it IV, pH 7.4. Basically, that's what this is. All right, where's the drug going to go when you give it IV? Well, let's take a look. If you subtract the two, set 5 and 7.4, the difference is 2.4, so it's a big difference, right? It's 10 to the 2.4, so it's 100 times more one, one form than the other. And it's an acid in a more basic pH. How do I know that? pH 7.4 is higher than pKa5. 7.4 is higher than 5. Because it's an acid in a more basic pH, it'll ionize. So it'll be 100% ionized in the blood. Right. Everybody with me? Is this going to have CNS effects? No, it's not going to go in the brain, is it? Is it going to the baby and the pregnant mom? No. 100% ionized. All right, let's do another one. Drug C, next box down. Drug C is a basic drug. pKa is 7.8. This is lidocaine, by the way. pKa is 7.8. And you put it in IV. You've all done this. Give a blast of lidocaine IV. And of course, in the pH in the blood, it's 7.4. So the question is, where is it going to go? Is slidocaine going to have CNS effects? Let's see. 7.8 minus 7.4. The difference between the two is 0.4. Right? Well, I could really pretty much stop there. All I have to know is if it's less than one difference, some part of it's going to be ionized and some part of it's going to be non-ionized. Right? So is it going to have CNS effects? Sure. What's the main side effect of too much slidocaine? Seizures. Oh, it must be getting in the brain if it's making seizures, right? Let's do it anyway. 7.8 minus 7.4, the difference is 0.4, and it's a basic drug in a more acidic environment. Basic drug 7.8 in a more acid pH 7.4. The difference is 0.4. I'm rounding it to 0.5. So we'll say it's 75% ionized, 25% non-ionized. There's your example for your question. Make sense? All right, let's do another one. Drug D. Drug D is a base pKa of 6. You put it in the stomach, swallow it as a pill, we'll say, and it's in a pH of 3. Are you going to absorb it from the stomach? Okay, let's see. The pKa is 6. pH is in is, it is in is 3. 6 minus 3 is 3. All right, so because it's logs, that really means 10 to the third. 10 to the third is 1,000. So what it's saying is it's going to exist in the body 1,000 times more something than the other thing. 1,000 times more ionized than not ionized. So let's take a look. And step two, it's a base in a more acidic environment, so it's going to ionize 99%. So if you look at drug molecules, a thousand molecules will be ionized for every one that isn't. So wait, that's pretty much essentially 100% ionized. So that's what the books say. Question. Can I uh, just go back to drug C? Sure. So when we when we have 20, 75, 25, so does that mean that 25, because it's ionized, is that correct? Non-ionized. Non -ionized. Non -ionized. So 25 percent will go anywhere it wants, and it will cross the blood brain barrier and the baby. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So not ionized will go anywhere it wants. Ionized it won't. Yes. Okay. Correct. Non-ionized will be able to go across any lipid barrier. The ionized will not. Okay. So if you give enough milligrams, the ionized portion, the ionized portion, will stay in the blood, but it'll drive the non-ionized portion into the brain. Okay. Thank you.
All right, want to do another one? One more? Let's do drug D, but this time we'll pretend it's an acid. So we'll say drug D is an acid with a pKa of 6. You swallow it as a pill, pH 3. Are you going to absorb it in the stomach? Well, 6 minus 3 is 3. So the difference is greater than 1. It's 100% something. In this case, it's an acid and a more acid pH. Therefore, it's going to be non-ionized. So yes, sir, you're going to absorb it very well in the stomach. Okay. What if it passes through the stomach? Now, the stomach's job in the human being is to be that really nasty environment. Churn, acids, enzymes, break things up, nothing's supposed to make its way through uh, the stomach un un unmessed with. It's supposed to be a bad break things up environment. But let's say the drug passes through the stomach into the intestine. It doesn't get all eaten up and stuff. Well, now the intestine, if you look at my little table on third page 32, Small intestine duodenum says 5 to 6. So let's say pH 6 as soon as it passes the gastric uh, sphincter. It gets into the intestines. Well, now it's a basic compound with a pH of 6, pK of 6. I'm saying drug D. But now it's in an environment with a pH of 6. Will it be absorbed in the intestine? Well, 6, and the pH is 6, the pKa is 6, and when they're the same, it's 50-50. So yes, you can absorb the drug into the intestines. So, most, and this is the uh, factor of most drugs. Most drugs are not absorbed in the stomach itself, per se, because it's just too nasty in the environment. It's, pH is so low, it's just inhospitable to, to anything. That's what it's supposed to be, right? But if the drug can not be broken down, or they can be enteric coated, or they can put it in some sort of a package, or they make it in a special capsule, and all the pharmaceutics people figure out how to get it to live long enough to get through the stomach, then it's going to be in an intestine, which is a much more favorable environment for absorption. So drugs, a lot of times, are not absorbed in the stomach, but they're absorbed in the intestine. In fact, that's probably the most common uh, scenario is that they're absorbed in the intestines, not in the stomach, unless it's an acid. So isn't there a way, like, if we put a J-tube in, we will have to change the concentration of that drug because it will be way more absorbed? There will be a higher concentration of that drug? Because if we yes, yes, that. very possibly, yep. Depending on the drug, but of course. Right. Yes, you can, absolutely. Okay, does that kind of make some sense? Let me say just a couple of bit, uh, just standard things that you don't even have to write down or anything. And it should, can be obvious. First of all, if a drug is an acid, it's pretty, pretty much be absorbed in the stomach. It's not going to be a problem, all right? Because acids are in an acid environment, they're going to be non ionized. That means they're lipid soluble. That means you can absorb in the stomach. So acid drugs are pretty well absorbed orally. Basic drugs are not, unless you can get them, formulate them somehow, package them so they can be in a pill, and they can get through the stomach into the intestine, and then they can be absorbed. Certainly, acid drugs are easier to absorb orally than basic drugs. All right. Now, let's take a, um, let's take my other example. Let's say. Let's take drug D. Now I'm going to show you a trick. Let's take drug D and we'll make it an acid. Just pretend. So we'll make a new problem. So we'll say drug D is an acid with a pKa of 6 and it's in an environment of 3. That's the stomach. Is it going to be absorbed? Question. So that's 6 minus 3 is 3. It's greater than one. That means it's 100% something. It's an acid in an acid environment. So yes, it'll be well absorbed. 
Everybody with me on that? Is it going to have CNS effects? Now wait, because we got to start all over again. Because now the drug is in a different pH, right? It's still an acid. It's pKa never changes. That's a constant. pKa is six. But once you absorb it into the bloodstream, now it's in a pH of 7.4, not stomach pH. All right, so you got an acid, pKa is 6, and it's in a pH, blood pH is 7.4. What's the difference? Well, 6 and 7.4, the difference is 1.4, so it's essentially 100% something, and 100% what? Well, it's an acid. And the pH is higher than its pKa, so it's an acid and a basic pH, so it's 100% ionized. So there is no CNS effects. So if I take this pill, yeah, I can get it into the body, okay, but I can't get it into the brain. Now, a lot of drugs, who cares? This doesn't have, if you're not trying to get it to the brain, then what's the difference? If it's going to the muscles, it's going to the left foot, if it's going to your liver, yeah, I mean, wherever it's going, as long as it has access via the blood, below your neck, then that's fine. If you want it to pass the blood-brain barrier, that's a select compartment in the body. The brain is compartmentalized away from all the nastiness going on elsewhere because the brain has to have much finer control. That's why there's a blood-brain barrier, you know, to put it bluntly, right? So. The drug will not have CNS effects, but you can absorb it orally. Does everybody see that? Yeah, of course. Um, at the bottom, when it says for acidic drugs, that doesn't, it says it's non-ionized Drug D? Uh, it does, yeah. With that, with yeah, I, ch I changed it. I, in the problem, it's basic. I was making a new problem. So just forget that box and... Let's write a new one. Oh, no, but I'm comparing it to the way bottom where it says for acidic drugs with the pH minus pKa less than zero, so it would be negative three, so it would be less than zero, so it would be non ionized. Like, uh, pH minus pKa less than zero. I think you mean zero, like the absolute value of zero, not like. Yeah, you have to use the absolute like value. Point Okay, does that make sense? They're just kind of... Now, as I mentioned, the... Uh, this obviously plays a role in, in uh, absorption through the stomach because you got to be lipid soluble to absorb through the stomach or intestines, you know, rectally, anywhere in the intestine, etc. It'll make a difference through CNS effects and it'll make a difference through placental transfer of drugs. Those are the three big areas we worry about as far as distribution. So you, absorption is one thing, but once you get it in the blood, you got to start all over from scratch and figure out a new calculation. Where will it go once it's in the blood? It's the example I gave in the last class, the muscle relaxants. Muscle relaxants are always 100% water soluble. They have, they're an exception because of a chemical quirk we'll learn about it next semester. So just take my word for it, they're always 100% water soluble. You can't swallow them orally, you can give them IV, they work fine. They're 100% what? Ionized. Water soluble. <clears throat> now, if I give rocuronium orally, it doesn't work. I give it IV, it works fine, you've done it a million times. Why? Because once it's in the blood, even though it's water soluble, the blood can carry it to the muscles. The receptors are on the surface of the muscle. They don't have to pass through any kind of lipid barrier. It attaches the receptor, you get paralyzed, you live happily ever after. And the, the blood muscle relaxants don't have CNS effects. But even though they're in the blood, they can't pass the blood brain barrier or placental barrier. They don't have fetal effects as well. Okay? So hopefully this will make a little bit more sense. It has to do with drug distribution. Now, metabolism, and I want to uh, talk about this for a second uh, next. And uh, so let's go to page 36. 
page 36. This is a drawing I took out of the New England Journal of Medicine. Like they, they have a great artist. They have lots of great drawings. I'll tell you what. I'll go in the camera. This is page 36. Drug metabolism. Uh, again, there's a reference from the New England Journal, and let's read what the person says. The effect of drug metabolism on excretion of drugs. Lipophilic, meaning philic means light, lipid, sol lipid soluble is also referred to as lipophilic. Lipid so fat soluble drugs are metabolized to form a relatively more hydrophilic or water soluble metabolite. So I said, we alluded to in class from last Friday, probably the biggest thing the liver does when it's presented with a drug is it looks, tries to figure out what kind of chemical reaction can I do to make this drug more water soluble. Because then when it gets to the kidney, it'll be peed out. And that's what they're trying to show here. This is a lipophilic drug. I'm circling on the top here. And it goes to the liver, gets metabolized. The metabolite is more water soluble. Hydrophilic means water soluble. It goes to the kidney and it gets excreted because it can't be reabsorbed through the kidney distal tubule membrane because that's a lipid membrane. All right? They're showing you the opposite thing. Let's say I have a, a lipid soluble drug and it doesn't get metabolized, it just goes to the kidneys, and the drug is retained because it gets reabsorbed through the distal tubule back into the bloodstream, and it just keeps cycling around. So one of the ways you can get the human body to pee something out is to make it more water-soluble. And that's the, probably, the, I would guess, the number one. purpose or rationale behind metabolism of drugs. Does everybody see that? Cool. <clears throat> so that is touching a little bit on drug absorption, distribution, metabolism and elimination. They all are influenced by pH, pKa, solubility, lipid and water solubility. Does that make sense? Well, hopefully this is a little bit easier. Okay, let's continue on with this drug metabolism. So let's go to page 37 and <clears throat> let me just, uh, just talk here for a minute. We're going to talk very briefly about this, just again to get some terms out. And we'll get into, obviously, drug metabolism a lot later on. All right, most drugs are metabolized in the liver. I think it's safe to say. Why? Well, that's what the liver does. It metabolizes things. That's the part of the body where it's supposed to break things up and get rid of them. Now, there's many drugs that aren't. Many, some are metabolized in the plasma, in the kidneys, in the lungs. I mean, you name it. Uh, in tissues of all kinds. There's except, many exceptions. We'll learn a lot, whole bunch of exceptions. But I think it would be safe. Nobody would throw something at me if I just made the general statement that most things, including drugs, are metabolized in the liver and then eliminated. All right? And where in the liver they're metabolized is there's a group of enzymes that are referred to as cytochrome enzymes. And they're in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of liver cells. So, harken back to your nursing bio 101. Follow me, follow me on this. Remember liver cells? They have a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. What does the endoplasmic reticulum do in the cell? Anybody want to say? I know. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of obscure, I know. <laughs> well, it's kind of the freeway system. 
it's a transport system inside the cell. It can move through the endoplasmic reticulum. There's a smooth and a rough, remember that? Why is the rough rough? Ribosomes. It's studied with ribosomes, which protein synthesis, that's what makes enzymes and proteins, and therefore they're right on the endoplasmic reticulum. In other words, they're next to the freeway, so they can just hop on the freeway and go off into the body somewhere. In the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, cell membrane, there's a family of enzymes, probably of over 100, that are called cytochrome enzymes. In the old days, they called them cytochrome P450 enzymes. All right. They uh, got P450 designation because in a laboratory, when you put them in a spectrophotometer, they bend light at a wavelength of 450. Who cares? <laughs> it has nothing to do with the human body, right? But that's just the name they come up with. Now, in pharmacology, we like to just call them drug metabolizing enzymes, because that's what they do as far as we're concerned. They're not really there just to do drugs. They're mostly there to do stuff that's in the body, like food and hormones and bile and enzymes and whatever the body has floating around in there. But since we worry about drugs at all, we just say drug metabolizing enzymes. And uh, they're also called microsomal enzymes because in a laboratory, if you take a, a little rat liver out, you make a milkshake out of it and then try to metabolize drugs with it, they form little globules, they call them microsomes. They don't have microsomes in the body. And it's a laboratory tested thing. They refer to them as microsomal enzymes because that's what you get when you make a milkshake out of a rat, rat liver. So the cytochrome P450 enzymes are a family of enzymes, and nowadays they have named everything. They have commissions that get together and uh, they name everything. And so they call them CYP enzymes, meaning cytochrome. And they've named them with a letter and then a number next to them, and then, oh my God, you get a headache, All right? But if you take a look on page uh, 37, I'll show it on the camera here. Here. Then you'll see this little pie chart. They're showing uh, all the, some of the different ones. And you can have, this is a uh, 2B6, 2C8, 2C9, 2E1. So you, they need, you know, the different enzymes, 100 and something enzymes, they give them a letter designation and then they give them a little number next to it. There's a E1 and E2 and E3 and E4. Nobody cares. I couldn't care less. All right. But you're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to get into the anesthetic drugs and they're going to say, or you're going to look at a package insert and it's going to say, this drug is metabolized in the liver by CYP2E6. And you go, oh, that's kind of interesting. Where's the closest Starbucks? I need a cup of coffee. <laughs> it's kind of nice to know, and that's fine. But so what, you know? So this is showing you that, look at this, percent of total intestinal P. So there's, there's a P450 in the intestinal wall, too. But this is hepatic. And all, all the different types and subtypes and so on. And, and we aren't going to worry about that at this point, other than I just want you to get the term. Now, by agreement in pharmacology, we break all drug metabolism into what we call two phases. Phase one, I have this on the bottom of page 37. I wrote it down for you. Phase one is either an oxidation reduction or hydrolysis reaction. So if the compound goes in the liver and it undergoes either oxidation or reduction, which is probably the most common reactions in chemistry, or it's hydrolyzed. A lot of our drugs are hydrolyzed in the plasma, and we're going to learn that. Then we call it a phase one reaction. This drug is metabolized, drug A is metabolized in the liver via a phase one reaction, comes up with a such and such metabolite, which is peed out in the kidneys. That's what every package insert is going to tell you. All right? 
Phase two are called conjugation or synthesis. Synthesis doesn't happen, really, for any extent purposes. They just throw it in there. Really, they're conjugation reactions. And what a conjugation reaction is this. Sometimes it's just too much work to break the molecule apart. It's going to cost too much energy. The body's always looking to conserve energy. And it's going to, you know, they have lots of big benzene rings, and it's going to take a lot of energy to, to do it. So the body will say this. It'll take glucose in the acid form. It's called glucuronic acid. It's just the acid form of glucose. There's sulfonic acid and a few others too, but mostly glucose. Why? Well, glucose is in every cell. It's easy to get. It's not a hard thing to come by in the body, right? And in the acid form, it's totally 100% water soluble. So it'll say, okay, I'll just stick a glucose molecule on this drug, and you'll pee out the glucose, and the drug will be dragged along with it. That's called conjugation. You make a new compound, and the compound then is more water soluble because glucose is sticking on the end of it. And you can pee out the glucose and you drag, drag the drug with it. So your little package insert, or you're going to learn in uh, when we do opiates, I'll say uh, morphine is metabolized in the liver and excreted as a glucuronide conjugate in the kidneys. That's what the literature is saying. Meaning you'll make a metabolite out of it, the liver will stick glucose on the metabolite, pee it out, done. Didn't have to burn a lot of energy. That's the lingo that they use. And we'll get into more of this uh, um, at a later date. Okay. Anybody have any questions about any of that? Anything about the PKA and pH? We're going to keep using it. I just want you to get the big picture. And again, this is one of my four introductory topics. And so. Uh, just kind of get it in front of you, and then we'll kind of start using it, and use the terminology a little bit more, and uh, see how it plays out. Okay. All right, let's take a break. Okay, anybody have any questions about PKA and pH? Again, please ask me. I know it's a kind of an odd concept. Uh, maybe what I'll do tomorrow is I'll bring some problems in, and we can do a couple of problems uh, together, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Now, uh, the third, well, the next thing I want to talk about is, uh, uh, I mentioned a little bit about metabolism, and so let's see where I left off. So let's see what I wrote here. This is page 38. Page 38. I just, I've already mentioned this, let's just see what I mean. Drug metabolism, hepatic metabolism of drugs occurs in a smooth endoplasmic reticulum of what into some in the size. My family of enzymes is known alternatively as DMEs, as the pharmacologists call them, drug metabolizing enzymes. Um, so CYP, some call them mixed function oxidase enzymes, cytochrome oxidase, etc. So that's what they're going to metabolize. And they're broken down into either phase one or phase two, being oxidation, conjugation, reduction. Now, finally, I want to get a couple terms, three terms, having to do with metabolism in front of you. And the first two are called uh, enzyme induction or enzyme inhibition. So let me just, and this is real simple, all right? The liver will be able to adapt its function up or down, depending on how much load is put on it. If you're constantly having to metabolize something 
the liver will say, well, maybe I better make some more enzymes to compensate for this extra work, metabolism. And that's called enzyme induction. Indu induction means make more or, or increase. And there are several, uh, in fact, dozens of drugs that are enzyme inducing agents in the liver and they increase the drug metabolizing capabilities of the liver. The other way around, very simple, you can have some compounds that are enzyme inhibitors and they go to the liver and make the liver uh, hepatic enzyme rate less. They inhibit drug metabolizing enzymes. Therefore, drugs are not going to be metabolized as well. So you can have enzyme induction up or enzyme inhibition, which is down, right? Very similar to up and down regulation with the receptors. Remember the terms I did last week. It's the same concept, it's just a different population. Up and down regulation refers to drug receptors. Enzyme induction and inhibition refers to liver enzymes. So you're referring to different proteins, concepts the same. So, for example, well, you're going you're to hear this, you're going to live this. Uh, somebody's an alcoholic. They tend to have tremendous enzyme induction because the constant alcohol load on the liver and the other things they do uh, tends to make the liver enzymes higher. Now, if I put an enzyme-induced patient to sleep, what do you think it's going to do clinically to my day at work? It's going to require more, a higher dose and probably faster, or more often. I'm going to have to keep giving over and over because they're going to metabolize everything so much faster. Now, it's not going to be true of every drug because if the drug isn't metabolized in the liver, it's not going to matter, right? But if the drug is, which most drugs are, liver metabolized, then an enzyme-induced patient is going to require more frequent dosing and higher doses. Conversely, an enzyme-inhibited patient, if I give them the usual dose of a drug, what's going to happen in them? There's a possibility for toxicity. The drug is going to last longer. You're going to get an exaggerated effect because the company came up with a dose relying on a certain amount of metabolism, and that metabolism isn't going to be there. So they're going to end up with a higher blood level, and they're going to have possibly an exaggerated effect. Okay? So those are the first, I said there's three terms, the first terms. So let's take a look, I got a picture of this. Drawing, I'm sorry. Drawing of this. All right, again, this is from the New England Journal. This is on page, uh, oh, I don't have a number. 39. 39, thank you. Page 39. What this has to do with is, um, do you ever hear the story about Grapefruit juice being an enzyme inhibitor, changing the uh, drugs. Uh, and it's true. And this is a, a drawing of that. All right, so this is Grandpa getting up in the morning and taking his uh, amlodipine, his, his calcium blocker, for his heart problem. And he drinks it with a, his pill with a glass of grapefruit juice. So what happens? Let's take a look. Normally, oh, this is philodipine. Uh, so, this is the normal dose. See where I'm pointing? Goes into the liver, gets metabolized, and out it goes. So, after oral administration of drug, CYP3A enzymes present in the liver, metabolize philodipine. Flo flo uh, Can't get my walk to work here. CYP3A enzymes in the liver further metabolize the drug, so only 15% of the dose is bioavailable, reaches the systemic circulation. So they're saying here that when you take philodipine, because of the fact that it's metabolized in the liver, only 15% actually gets into the bloodstream. Bioavailability, remember that term? Is 
So the company's going to calculate the ED99, the usual dose, to compensate for that 15% bioavailability. But if grandpa takes his grapefruit juice, grapefruit juice selectively inhibits CYP3A, which is supposed to be metabolizing the drug. Therefore, instead of being 15% bioavailable, now it's 45% bioavailable. So three times as much is getting into the blood as expected because you drank grapefruit juice. So what's going to happen to Grandpa? He's going to have much exaggerated effect of the drug. Hopefully it's not going to hurt him, you know, too much or whatever, but you, you get the point. Now, the term for this, and it's right here, it's called first pass metabolism. First pass metabolism. What it means is this. When you ingest anything orally, the human body is designed for it to be absorbed through the gastric or intestinal mucosa, usually the intestines. And the first place it goes is portal circulation into the liver. So the liver can check it out. Liver checks it out, maybe metabolizes it, how much am I going to release? Yeah, this is okay, let it go. Boom. It goes into the bloodstream. The first pass comes from the fact that absor orally absorbed substances, and we care about drugs in this class, so we'll say drugs, first pass through the liver before they get in the bloodstream. That's just the way anatomically the human body works. And in its first pass through the liver, see, first pass metabolism. Some is going to be metabolized. And then it's all calculated into the usual dose of the drug. So drugs that are highly liver metabolized have a high first pass extraction before you get them into the bloodstream, meaning they'll have a low bioavailability. Oh, all these terms. What is he talking about? <laughs> It all makes sense now. Okay? So I was the three liver metabolism, I'm, I'm summarizing here. I'm done. The three drug metabolism terms I wanted to get were enzyme induction, enzyme inhibition, and first pass. They call it first pass hepatic extraction or first pass metabolism. All right, does that make sense, these concepts? Well, you start using those as well. Wearing out, aren't I? <laughs> okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go to page 50. Okay, page 50. Now, introductory topic number three. We're going to get off of this drug ionization thing, and we're going to go to the next topic. We're jumping around. It's going to seem like I don't have any make sense, but trust me, there's a method of my madness.
So topic number three is going to be the autonomic nervous system. And I want to talk about this just a little bit with some terminology because, as I mentioned the first day, we spend an inordinate amount of time in the operating room messing around with people's autonomic systems, controlling their blood pressure, heart rate, respiration, heart contractility, the secretion of hormones, their blood sugar, their fluid balance, their electrolyte balance, etc. All of which are functions of the autonomic system. And there's some terminology that's uh, commonly used and so <clears throat> I want to be able to use that when we start talking about the anesthetics. So just at this point, and we're going to cover this in gory detail next semester. So just get some basic terms uh, out there. And I'll go on the camera. This is page 50. And I can't get this. To... Oh, guess what? Yeah. All right, I'm going to give you a color one. I finally got it. Page 50. Now, let me just talk. Don't worry about anything. The autonomic system is devised to, or designed to control the internal environment of the, of the, uh, the body without you having to think about it, whether you're asleep, you're awake, whatever. Your blood pressure, your heart rate, and everything was controlled. And you adapt to the, your environment and, and what's going on, you know, how cold it is in the room, what's your posture, you're standing up, laying down, uh, what kind of stresses are being put on the body at this time. So you have the, you know, exquisite ability to adapt to keep you in an even keel, homeostatic, uh, despite what's going on outside. One of the main ways we do that is by our changing autonomic function. In the autonomic nerve system, of course, you had this a million times in previous nursing classes, etc., and it's broken down into sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. In general, the sympathetic tends to be inhibitory, the parasympathetic tends to be excitatory, except in the heart, cardiovascular, it's the opposite. And some areas of the body only have one or the other. You're gonna, we're going to learn all this next semester. We're going to learn every tissue in the body and what kind of receptor and, and nervous system is there. But just for an example, the blood vessels in the body, there is no parasympathetic control of blood vessel. It's all sympathetic. So either how, how vasoconstricted or dilated you are is all a function of the sympathetic system. On the other side of the coin, there are certain areas of the body that are strictly parasympathetic, depending on the tone, how vagal that particular body, part of the body has to be. So there's exceptions and so on and so forth. But for the most part, they tend to be opposite systems. One stimulates, one depresses, and they both innervate some certain area of the body. Um, the, uh, the uh, Early classes that I took, they always talked about the fight or flight system. Remember that? I still don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> uh, but uh, but it, it kind of sounded good. I sit down in my head and try to not to nod off. Um, but at any rate, um, the autonomic system is depicted uh, graphically or you know drawing wise. Uh, in this way, in this manner. So let's go through my little drawing. Um, this uh, kind of tan looking thing here is your spinal cord. So what we're, I'm trying to show is that the, uh, there's an autonomic center in the brain stem of the, uh, in the brain, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And the innervation, sympathetic wise, comes out of the brain into the spinal cord and then goes out into the various tissues. The sympathetics tend to run thoracic and early lumbar spinal cord, so they'll have T1, T2, T3, T4, etc., etc. 
They have sympathetic nerves come out. You're going to memorize them all for somebody, not me. Because <laughs> you got to learn to produce spinals and epidurals and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, a lot of people refer, a lot of books refer to it as the thoracal lumbar system because the nerves leave the brain and go out through the thoracic and, and lumbar areas. Uh, the parasympathetic system is, for all intents and purposes, the vagus nerve. It's 99% the vagal nerve, maybe 99, 90, 95, I don't know. I forgot the number. But it's essentially the vagus nerve. And that's a cranial nerve. So it comes out lateral to the spinal cord. And then vagus in Latin means wandering. It just wanders all over, innervates all the different uh, uh, organs. And uh, uh, so you have vagal input or parasympathetic in input to all the different organs. What's the point? Well, the point is this. You want all your organs to work as, as, as a functioning unit in concert, right? If I want, if I'm working stressful, if I'm at the gym and I'm jogging and running on a treadmill, I want everything to do the same thing. I want my heart rate to go up. I want the heart to pump more blood. I want more blood to get to the tissues so I don't need to dilate certain areas of the muscle. I want my blood sugar to go up so I have more energy. I want to burn more fat because fat's a great source of energy. You want all these things to happen at the same time. So all the different parts of your body have got to get the same message at the same time. And the way the body communicates to itself is via the autonomic system. So everything's working as one, hopefully, uh, uh, copacetic unit and all working towards the same goal. When you're sleeping, then everything can slow down. You can tell the liver and the kidneys and the, uh, you know, take it easy, you breathe slower, blood pressure can relax, and so on and so forth. So the point is, the autonomic system controls the internal environment of your body, and the reason why there's nerves that communicate to each area is because you want all the same your kidneys, your liver, your pancreas, your thyroid, your heart, your lungs to get the same message at the same time. So they all know what the other parts are doing, and you can all work to, to maintain a healthy uh, environment for the body. Does that make sense? So the, uh, the way we draw this out is, well, here's parasympathetics at the top and sympathetics at the bottom. I'm pointing with my pen, which doesn't, doesn't help, does it? So the parasympathetic, as I said, is primarily the vagus nerve. There's a little bit of hypoglossal, uh, some to your larynx, in fact, when you're studying the airway. And there's some in the sacral area, rectal area, there's some parasympathetic. Uh, you learn about that when you do uh, caudal blocks or epidurals for, for labor. But for the most part, it's the vagus nerve. So what happens is uh, the vagus nerve comes out, it's cranial nerve, lateral to the spinal cord, and then it out in the body somewhere, it synapses at what we call a ganglia. So there's a parasympathetic ganglia. This is what this circle is showing here. All right. What's a ganglia? Everybody remember? Anatomy 101 or physiology 101? With the nucleus. All right. It's a collection of nerve cell bodies outside the CNS. It's brain tissue in your periphery, basically. You say it in another word, right? It's nerve tissue, collection of nerves, cell bodies, outside of the brain. It's off in the periphery. And you got a cilia ganglia, and you got a, you know, all over a different ganglia in the body. So <clears throat> you have a nerve entering the ganglia, and then you have a postganglionic nerve leaving the ganglia. So what does the ganglia do? Why is it there? Well, what it does is it's kind of an integration point or an amplification point. I can have one nerve, one little tiny fiber leaving the spinal cord, going into the ganglia, and I could have a thousand nerves coming out of the ganglia. And they all get the same message. And I have a thousand nerves going to all these different organs with this message of whatever I, the message is. And all I had to do was send it into the ganglia with one nerve. So it's an amplification point or an integration point, whatever word you want to use, for sending messages around the body 
uh, if you didn't have ganglia, then you'd have to send a thousand nerves out of the brain into the periphery, and your head would have to be the size of that jack-in-the-box guy that in the commercials, remember that big head? Because you'd have so many nerves having to come out of your brain. This way you can have a normal sized head and wear a hat and everything. <laughs> so basically, that's what the ganglia do. There's a parasympathetic ganglia, and there are sympathetic ganglia. The postganglionic nerves, I've shown one here, but there could be anywhere, 10, 100, 1,000, go off, and they go off to whatever tissue they're going to, the heart, the lungs, the pancreas, the thyroid, whatever. That's in purple here. They call it the effector organ. So what organ are you sending the nerve to? What board do you want to get the message? All right. And there's a synapse, etc., when the nerve finally gets to the organ. All message transfer in the human body is neurochemical transmission, right? So you got a nerve sending a message and a chemical involved as well sending the message. All right. Now, in parasympathetic nerves, we call this ganglion, we call it preganglionic nerve. The preganglionic nerve squirts the chemical acetylcholine. I have it right here. See the blue blue circle, ACH in there, acetylcholine. So the neurotransmitter at presynaptic parasympathetic ganglia is acetylcholine. Because it's acetylcholine, then we call the receptor that uh, uh, recognizes the release of acetylcholine. We call it a cholinergic receptor after the fact that acetylcholine is what simulates it. All right, make sense? On the parasympathetic, uh, I'm sorry, sympathetic side on the bottom here, the neurotransmitter at the preganglionic sympathetic nerves is, you can see from my little drawing, acetylcholine. And the receptor that it attracts, this is a little blue pill looking thing that's supposed to be the receptor. The receptor that recognizes the release of acetylcholine is called a cholinergic receptor. And in fact, there are two, I'm going off on a tangent here, there are two subtypes of cholinergic receptors. There are cho nicotinic cholinergic receptors and there are muscarinic cholinergic receptors. Where do we come up with this term, all right? Well, way back 70 years ago, in a laboratory somewhere, and they were doing uh, frog studies, I think it was, uh, the scientist uh, took nicotine, the substance nicotine, and he was dripping it on hearts and noticed that they sped up. So he said there must be some receptor that recognizes nicotine, and to make the long story short, they found out eventually it was an acetylcholine receptor, but they specific to nicotine, so they call them nicotinic receptors. We don't have nicotine in the body usually, right? So it's not like a body thing. It's just that's what they called them because that's what they did in the laboratory. The same is true of muscarin. There's a chemical called muscarin, and when you drip muscarin in different acetylcholine receptors, they responded, so he decided to refer to them as muscarinic. So now if you look here, I have a point to all this. The ganglionic receptor at both parasympathetic and sympathetic, see my drawing, are what? Nicotinic cholinergic receptors. So the ganglionic receptors are acetylcholine receptors, they're cholinergic receptors, and most specifically they're nicotinic cholinergic receptors. So let me backtrack. Oh, I love to repeat. On both the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, the nerves that innervate the ganglia, the preganglionic nerves in both systems squirt out acetylcholine. That acetylcholine, of course, has to have a receptor to recognize it. In this case, the receptors in both ganglia, parasympathetic and sympathetic, are cholinergic receptors and more specifically nicotinic 
cholinergic receptors. Right? Everybody with me? Now, postganglionic neuron, that means after the ganglia, sending it out to the tissue in both the parasympathetic and sympathetic, all right? Let's start with the parasympathetic. The postganglionic neuron, the neurotransmitter at the tissue that squirts into the synapse when the nerve synapses with whatever organ or tissue it's going to, is acetylcholine. And the receptor is called a funny cholinergic receptor. But in this case, it's a muscarinic cholinergic receptor. All right. Now, on the sympathetic side, postganglionic sympathetic nerves, when they get to the organ they're going to, squirt out norepinephrine, catecholamines. In this case, I put NE here, little NE, norepinephrine. You can have sympathetic nerves that squirt out epinephrine. There are some in the adrenal medulla. And you can, in very short supply, have them that squirt out dopamine. A little bit in the periphery, they're mostly in the brain. Nonetheless, the, major, the main neurotransmitter in sympathetic, postganglionic sympathetic nerves, I'm trying to use these terms so that you get used to hearing them, is norepinephrine. And the receptor that norepinephrine attaches to, to produce its response, is called an adrenergic receptor. I have it right here. Adrenergic receptor. See, I wrote it down. They're named after adrenaline. In the old days, we used to call epinephrine adrenaline. The Brits still do. In the United States, we changed it to epinephrine. But the name stuck, and still they're called adrenergic receptors. There's three types of adrenergic receptors, alpha, beta, and dopamine. I don't have that on here. It's more detail than we need at this point, anyway. OK, that's it. All right, let's say it one more time. That's the whole picture. All right, there's parasympathetic nerves and sympathetic nerves that go to a tissue. The, uh, they all have a ganglia amplification point. Both the parasympathetics and sympathetics have ganglia. The preganglionic neurons in both systems uh, release norepinephrine as their neurotransmitter. The ganglia has nicotinic cholinergic receptors to recognize that release and to continue the message onward to the postganglionic neurons. The postganglionic neurons in the parasympathetic system in turn squirt out acetylcholine. However, they attach to a muscarinic cholinergic receptor, not nicotinic. On the sympathetic side, the sympathetic postganglionic nerves squirt norepinephrine, and the receptors are called adrenergic receptors, alpha, beta, and dopamine. They recognize norepinephrine. All right. Now, oh, let's talk drugs. That's the whole point. You just look at my book, you're going to see a whole chapter uh, referred to as sympathomimetic amines. What does it mean? Well, if a drug acts the same way the sympathetic nervous system acts, it mimics it. So the sympathetic nervous system, let's just take the heart. If I release epinephrine, this is, you guys know this. If I have a uh, catecholamine release, epinephrine release, what happens? My heart beats harder and it beats faster. The conduction velocity goes through the heart faster. It's called dromotropic effect, right? And so the heart's stimulated. If I give a drug that stimulates the heart, dopamine, isoproteranol, dobutamine, levofed, you name it, then that's called a sympathomimetic effect. Mimetic means we're mimicking. We're mimicking the sympath sympathetic nervous system. 
this receptor, this adrenergic receptor, isn't there because 5,000 years later, the, some humans are going to discover a drug that needs a receptor to work at. Right? The receptor is there because that's the way the body works. It's there to respond to the body's own chemical. We're just manipulating with drugs. So we have a whole series of drugs that we're going to learn that are referred to as sympathomimetic, meaning they can mimic what the sympathetic nervous system does. Right? We have a whole series of drugs that are sympatholytic. Lytic means block, L-Y-T-I-C, lytic. Look at any pharmacology book, they're going to have a chapter called sympatholytic drugs, or at least a whole several paragraphs about them. Sympatholytic means block, blocking the sympathetics. All right, and then, of course, on the other side, parasympathomimetic and parasympatholytic also exist, drug-wise. All right, make sense? Now, what if, for example, I say I'm doing a case and uh, the patient's heart rate is 40? All right, we're going to pretend. You're in the sim room and Jeremy's messing with you and he changes the heart rate down to 40. <laughs> now, what? what do I do now? I got to make the heart rate go up, in other words, right? What drug do I give to do that? Well. You could give a sympathomimetic drug, something to stimulate the heart, ephedrine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and I'm worried, I'm worried, I'm worried. stimulate the heart. So that would be a sympathomimetic amine, an agonist, attaches the receptor and stimulates it. Or you could give a anticholinergic. Muscarinic blocker. What, what is that? You've given it a million times. Atropine, right. So you can give a drug atropine. Atropine goes to this receptor and blocks the parasympathetic system. It's an antagonist. It just goes on the receptor and sits there and does nothing. But now acetylcholine can't get there, so acetylcholine doesn't affect it. There's no slowing effect anymore. So what happens? You got an unopposed sympathetic side and the heart rate goes up. So atropine causes tachycardia. Not because it stimulates the heart, it's because it blocks the slowing of the heart by the parasympathetic system. So these are two drugs, they both cause tachycardia, they both work on different receptors in different nervous systems, and they both produce the same end result. See where I'm going with this? Okay. So, I can give, you know, a beta stimulant, a beta blocker. Uh, that beta blocker would be called sympatholytic. A beta stimulant would be called sympathomimetic. I could give a drug like atropine. Atropine can be called parasympatholytic. It could be called anticholinergic. It is. If you want to be the most correct, and of course we always want to be pharmacologically correct, it was actually anti-muscarinic. Why? Because atropine doesn't work here or here. It doesn't work on nicotinic cholinergic receptors. It only works on muscarinic. So it's anti-muscarinic. Anti so we can just learn the receptors and then which drug that goes to which and we know what happens from what the receptor is. Okay, so let me summarize this one last time until you want to throw something at me. <laughs> and then we're going to call it a day, all right? So let's go through it one last time. Just the terminology. It's all right, th right there. All right, Sym parasympathetic and sympathetic systems have preganglionic neurons, which go from the, send messages from the brain to the spinal cord, in the case of sympathetics, or through the vagus nerve, cranial nerves, and the parasympathetic. They synapse at a ganglion where the nerve squirts out a neurotransmitter. In the case of both the parasympathetic and sympathetic systems, the neurotransmitter at the ganglia happens to be acetylcholine. The receptors, the little blue pills here, that recognize the release of acetylcholine 
are referred to as nicotinic subtype cholinergic receptors. The postganglionic neurons that send the message off to all over the body uh, from the ganglia uh, squirt out uh, neurotransmitters. In the case of the parasympathetic system, the neurotransmitter is again acetylcholine, but in this case the receptor is referred to as a muscarinic cholinergic receptor. On the sympathetic side, the neurotransmitter is norepinephrine, and a couple of places epinephrine or a couple of places dopamine. Let's just stick to norepinephrine for now. And the receptor that recognizes the release of norepinephrine is referred to as an adrenergic receptor, alpha, beta, or dopamine. A drug that stimulates an adrenergic receptor is called a sympathomimetic drug. A drug that blocks an adrenergic receptor, alpha blocker, beta blocker, dopamine blocker, is called sympatholytic. Conversely, a drug which stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system is referred to as parasympathomimetic, and a blood that, drug that blocks the parasympathetic nervous system is referred to as parasympatholytic or vagolytic, sometimes people just call them anticholinergic, anti-muscarinic, they're all in the same thing. All right, any questions? See you tomorrow.